All right, I've successfully made our next speaker uh, self-conscious enough that I get to give an introduction. Yay, come on, yeah. Yeah, I don't know why she's self-conscious, though. She's given this talk quite a few times because you all haven't listened. Raise your hand if you have an amateur radio ticket. Oh. Wait, why are we doing this? <laughs> okay, we can go home now. Okay, yeah, actually, that's, that's great. Those of you that didn't raise your hands, uh, make sure that you're coming closer to the front row, please. <laughs> Uh, because seriously, if you're in this room and you don't have an amateur radio ticket, somewhere along the line you forgot that the test was next door and it takes like an hour to study. So Kat's going to help you out, tell you why you want to do it and a little bit about the fun she's had doing it. And hopefully you all really enjoy it because I know we do. And we do check licenses when you transmit, just as a reminder. All right. So, um, yeah, so I couldn't see who doesn't have an amateur radio license yet. Okay, so there's some liars in the audience. Great. Cool. <laughs> so, uh, what is amateur radio? Um, it's basically using RF spectrum for non-commercial purposes, which, according to its reputation, includes things like experimentation and contests, uh, emergency communications, and mostly talking about the weather with old guys. It's also where you can turn your Wi-Fi up to 11, make drones fly sideways, and accidentally or not set things on fire. Um, so I've been a ham since 2013. I got licensed weeks before my first hacker summer camp, so yay. And um, like you said, I've given this talk a few times. This is a reboot, so apologies if I ruin anyone's childhood. Um, it's been a really good, inexpensive way to start learning about security. There's a lot of overlap in concepts between uh, amateur radio and security. Um, this was hacking before we had a word for it. People were tinkering with technology in the early 20th century. Um, so it's been a good way for me to connect with geeks of all ages. We've got a lot to learn from generations other than our own, serve my community, help out in disasters, and generally play around. So before I go any further, a little disclaimer. Um, there will be some more rules later, but nobody likes starting with a huge pile of rules. Um, you might be thinking, do I really need to be licensed to do all these things? Um, yes, in short. There are people out there, believe it or not, who have nothing better to do all day than to sit around, listen for illegal radio transmissions, and narc. Um, I am told that the FCC warning letters uh, are referred to among some hams as love letters from Laura, named after the woman who's in charge of the FCC's Enforcement Bureau. Don't get a love letter from Laura. It comes with a $10,000 fine, and the license is only $15. So just remember, you can listen all you want. If you want to join in, that costs extra. Also, don't fucking swear on the radio. <laughs> oh, so close to having this be a clean talk. Shit. So what does ham radio have to do with security? Uh, there's a lot of really great security-related radio research already being done, and having a ham license opens up a world of possibilities. Um, there's an entire village of talks devoted to it. Uh, it can give you the tools to make mediocre firmware better, allow you more power to work with, um, and just give you a bigger playground to make some amazing, excellent scientific discoveries. So I'm just going to give you a few examples of some uh, security-related radio research that's been done. These are other people's work who have done way cooler things than I have, but just to give you a realm of possibilities. Um, taking somebody else's cheap or obsolete technology and making it do your bidding is something hams have been doing for years, and it's really relevant in security. Um, earlier this year at ShmooCon, Travis Goodspeed gave a talk about updating the MD380. It's a radio that's about $100, and he made it worth about $1,000, giving it capabilities for private channels, repeaters, um, just a lot of additional functionalities by reversing the firmware. Um, also by him and by Michael Osman, the infamous pink pager. Who has seen those before? Yeah, they're starting to get really well known and they're actually hard to find. This was like a $13 children's toy called the IM Me that was just a texting device. And it turns out the radio chip and it wasn't frequency locked, so you can turn it into a really high quality spectrum analyzer. It overlaps. <laughs> Yeah, and it's pink, so win. <laughs> and it gets used a lot in other people's radio research, uh, like the garage door hack last year, Open Sesame, where they were able to sniff the opening codes of garage door openers and reprogram them. 
So a lot of functionality, very low price. Um, longer and stronger range, that is. Um, if you're playing a cyber drinking game at home, I'm about to make an Internet of Things reference. Um, yep, I, I had to make some jokes knowing that some would bomb, but one will stick one of these days. <laughs> um, recently, Radio Research has exposed some serious vulns in non-Bluetooth wireless keyboards and mice, including the recently announced key sniffer. Um, I had to miss the Bastille guy's talk, but I don't know if he mentioned that at all, because um, they were the ones who did that. Um, so remember that scene from Cryptonomicon where they used a radio to sniff keystrokes from the next room? That can actually be done. Um, many of the protocols in these devices have no level of protection whatsoever. They're cheap Chinese knockoffs. Um, even the non-cheap Chinese knockoffs. Um, keystrokes can be sniffed in clear text and malicious keystrokes can be sent. And um, ham radio, you can go longer and stronger. Um, you can transmit with more power. Uh, Non-ham bands, the, um, the maximum power is 500 milliwatts, and for hams, depending on the band, you can use up to 1,500 watts of power. That is fucking huge. <laughs> um, this, this was um, demonstrated a few years back as well um, with Kristen Padgett's uh, long-range RFID talk. She managed to use a directional antenna called Yagi and a ham radio and read RFID tags at 500 feet. And that was using only one watt of power. You can use up to 1,500 watts. She estimated a one mile read range. Science. <laughs> so playing with radios can lead to completely unexpected discoveries. Um, a couple of years ago at DEF CON, one of my all time favorite talks, Maggie Hauregi um, set fires to hair dryers with a Yagi antenna. Um, Girl Fault Interrupted was the title. She got a ham radio license for the exclusive purpose of lighting things on fires while transmitting on uh, fire singular. <laughs> while transmitting on walkie talkies, she discovered that she could trip the GFCI outlets in her bathroom and so got a ham license and was able to hone this into really precise frequencies to the point where you could take a radio with a big ass antenna in it, point it at a hair dryer, release the magic smoke. And the science behind this was. Um, the solenoids in some older GFCIs would resonate at the frequency, and so they would resonate to the point of actually burning. So that's cool, starting fires in hair dryers, that's great. Um, but GFCIs are also in medical equipment, so that's kind of scary. This has implications for remote kill, or even accidental kill. So why is there so much interest in RF? Um, so this is a uh, frequency allocation chart. Oh, sorry, this is the wrong frequency allocation chart. Um, <laughs> of all the frequencies in the U.S., um, unlicensed bands are unlicensed because they're so short range. Um, 2.4 gigahertz, 900 megahertz, the ISM bands, tiny little range. So many radio devices will assume that they're the only things on the band. Um, some protocols like Bluetooth has some protections, but many wireless devices don't. There are a lot of devices crowded around these bands, um, which overlap with ham bands. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, XB, cordless phones, RFID, baby monitors, they're everywhere. Everything has a radio in it. You have radios on you right now. Um, and remember when we said that you can read these at hundreds and hundreds of feet? So they're the only thing on the band, or at least they assume they are. So that works like having a secured area where if you talk to someone in the secured area, it must be okay. No one's ever social engineered their way into a secured area before. Totes cool. Um, obviously, these bands are not a secured area. Unlicensed spectrum is everywhere out there. Devices are constantly screaming out their own name, and anyone can listen. Ham radio can pick up on all of it. Um, a good proof of concept of this uh, was the party mode belt buckle, um, also by Travis Goodspeed. Um, he does good radio work. I'm referencing him a lot, but there's a good reason. Um, so he's neighborly. He wants a belt buckle to say howdy. So he builds it um, to say hi to whatever, whatever is out there. Walked around, fuzzed an entire city's power grid, because they all said howdy back. All of these devices. So a few rules about amateur radio because of that. Um, You'll learn a lot of rules as you're studying for your exam, and then you'll figure out most of them, um, except for the ones like don't 
climb a radio tower in the rain wearing no shirt. Um, <laughs> so um, stay in your lane. Different types of radios serve specific purposes. Um, ham, CB, FRS, commercial all have different requirements about the type of equipment you can use, uh, differences in power level regulations, and frequency ranges. Um, so even if your radios have the capability to transmit on a different type of band, it might not be allowed. Um, for example, some radios just don't have a power setting that's low enough to do non-ham transmissions. So be sure you're being conscientious of that. Um, to be able to trans transmit with more power means you can often blast over other signals, and that's not always a good thing, because um, as with before, you're sharing airwaves with a lot of different things. So about encryption, um, in case you're wondering why all these signals are floating around out there, um, Part 97 of the FCC rules state that it's illegal to obscure the content of a message um, so that someone listening can't ascertain the original meaning. Um, so that's where they stand on encryption. Um, digital modes aren't encryption, they're just different types of communications protocol. It's Morse isn't encryption, PSK31 isn't encryption, um, just as hex or base64 aren't encryption, they're just, they're just different forms of text. Um, encrypted transmissions are illegal on amateur radio bands except for communicating telemetry data with RC aircraft um, and only on the bands that they're on, which is mostly 6 meters, 70 centimeters, and the ISM bands, and also um, um, satellite control. Um, Stego is more of a gray area. Um, I mean, it's not encryption per se, just obfuscation, so the precedent on that isn't really clear. Um, so err on the side of caution. <laughs> So other countries, given that uh, a bunch of us are threatening to jump the border after the election, um, <laughs> there are some rules about using your license in other countries. Uh, if you're licensed in the US, if you have an extra class license, the highest level, um, you can operate in other countries that have a reciprocal agreement with the US. There's various reciprocal agreements you can look up. The US and Canada also have additional reciprocity. If you have any level of license in your home country, you can use it in the other country. Are there any Canadians here? Woo! Um, and to get licensed in the US, they don't check citizenship or anything. Um, you just need a US mailing address. So as long as you've got that, it doesn't even need to be a home address. It can be a PO box. So who wants to be a ham? Great. Now we're going to talk about how. So there are three levels of license in the US. Um, the technician is the lowest level. Um, it's easy by design. The idea is they want you to get licensed first and then learn your way around amateur radio, not vice versa. They just want you to have the piece of paper. Um, tech is restricted to VHF and UHF, which are bands uh, above 30 meters or megahertz. Um, these are all very short range frequencies. Um, so that just means that you can't cause an international incident. They're local. Uh, if you want to cause an international incident, you'll need to go up to general. General is the middle level. This gives you access to a lot of the HF bands below 30 megahertz. Not all privileges on all bands, but a vast majority. Uh, the highest level is amateur extra, usually just called extra. Um, this gives you all privileges on all bands. You can be volunteer examiner to any level and gives you some other neat things like international reciprocal operation. So the extra exam is pretty hard, but the number of licensees that are extra has increased dramatically since the Morse code requirement was dropped in 2007. So you no longer need Morse code for any level of exam. Um, all in all, there are over 727,000 hams in the US, and I had to update that number from last year because it's continuing to grow, so that's amazing. About half of these are tech. So it's alive and well. Um, the exams are multiple choice. They're unlimited time exams. They're purposely very low tech so that they can be given out anywhere. They look very dated, but they want you to be, they want to get as many people licensed as possible and to be able to do that at any time. Um, it's easier, it's more useful than a CISSP, probably the cheapest cert you'll ever get. Um, so tech in general are generally concerned with rules, common sense, safety, band plans, really basic electronics. There's really only two calculations that you'll use, um, frequency and wavelength, um, which you just need to know the speed of light, which is 300 million meters per second. 
Um, and so just get good at dividing 300 by things. Um, and the other one is Ohm's law. Anyone? Yep, current times voltage. Shit, I fucked that up. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> uh, current times resistance equals voltage. <laughs> voltage times current equals power. Um, the extra exam is more elect. I don't have to take it. I have it already. <laughs> and the extra exam has some more um, complex calculations. Um, general has some more too. Um, some of them have really hilarious wrong answers like um, a beverage antenna is not an antenna constructed out of beverage cans. Although that would be a really cool Wi-Fi village contest. Um, and the extra... <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> and the extra is more electronics heavy, radio design, circuit theory, um, stuff that if you're not building a radio, you might not necessarily use as much. Um, but again, it's a lot easier now that there's no more Morse code. Okay. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean, however, that Morse code has no use anymore. Morse is way more easily detectable than voice or data when signals are poor, which is a lot of times when it's being used. It uses so little bandwidth, so you can set out an SOS in Morse code. Um, many repeaters also use Morse code for station identification, and it shows up in CTFs and puzzles. For example, it's been a part of past DEF CON badge challenges, and I know it was part of the B-Sides badge challenge last year, pretty sure. Um, yeah, like I said before, the cheapest cert you'll ever get. Um, so you walk in, pay $15, show photo ID, and hopefully you walk out with a license. If you pass, you can take the next one, then the next one. And you need to pass them in sequence. Even if you think you're lead enough to pass the extra on the first go, you need to take tech in general first. Plus, you get really good bragging rights if you've gone zero to hero. Um, so your license fee pays for your license for 10 years, and then you just renew it online for free. You don't have to pay anymore. And you'll be given a call sign. If you want, you can upgrade to a vanity like mine. Um, used to cost extra, but now it's free. Um, and zero OB is taken, if you're wondering. <laughs> um, volunteer examiners are also, they're volunteers. They don't get paid from the exam fee. They, we work for free. The money all goes to um, the, the volunteer examiner coordinator, which is usually, um, in most cases, the ARRL, the American Radio Relay League. Um, and occasionally the team will get reimbursed for expenses, but yeah, we work for free. So, where to find exams? Get tested at a con. Um, I heard that not many people took the exams today at DEF CON, so they're running them again tomorrow, and you should. They're going for eight hours, so you got no excuse. Eight hours? Yeah. Um, they've stopped running today, but you can get their test tomorrow, and I promise you, if you don't have a license, you have time between now and then to study for the tech exam. Y you don't need to spend more than a few hours on it. So other than that, um, you can find exam sessions in most major cities. They usually run them at least once a month. So check ARRL's website for when they're running. Um, there are some other cons um, that have hold, held security ex or ham radio exams in the past. If you know of any others that I missed on there, please let me know and I'll update my slides for any potential future iterations of this talk. Um, for studying for the tests, there is a wealth of resources, and this is because all three question pools are given away for free. And so HAMS can develop really excellent study resources by HAMS for HAMS. Um, as far as books go, the ARRL makes license manuals that not only cover the test material itself, but also HAM radio culture, which is a great introduction if you're not that familiar with what you can do. Uh, Gordon West has study guides with the exam material in audiobook form, so you can listen on your commute. Uh, KB6NU makes guides. There's lots of online study resources, flashcards. I personally used hamstudy.org a lot. It was really good. In general, if you Google Amateur Radio Study Guide, uh, you'll find a wealth of resources. There's also mobile apps for every platform, even Windows Phone, maybe not BlackBerry. Um, there's the Ubuntu HAMS IRC chat that's got a question bot that'll feed you questions and Ubuntu even has a HAM exam package. Um, if you want something that's in person, um, often uh, places will have HAM radio boot camps that are one to two day crash courses and they'll usually have an exam at the end. And those are usually free um, with the test fee built in. Um, in general, 
the resources, you shouldn't be paying a lot of money to study for this. Um, just as an important warning, the question pools do change every four years. Extra just changed in July. The next one to change will be tech in 2018. So just make sure that you're working with the most up-to-date material. Um, they usually don't change that much, but there might be one or two questions and you don't want to repeatedly be memorizing the wrong answer. Um, my own study process varied for each of the three exams. I went about it different ways. The first time around, I spent a lot of time um, reading up on the, in the AWRL book because I wanted to have some context for what I was learning. I was pretty new to the worlds of both ham radio and security. Um, for general, two months later, I spent a little more time on the test material than the culture. And when I got to extra, I pretty much memorized the question pool. That was what I was going to do. I knew there were large portions of it that I was never going to remember after the exam, and I was right. I think I can still calculate resonance, though. So now that you've got a license, what next? Step one, get a radio. The beauty of ham radio is it's only as expensive as you want it to be. A good HT, which is a handheld transceiver, starts around $30. Um, I highly recommend the Baofeng UV5R. It's $30, it comes in a bunch of colors. You can have a camouflage radio, that's cool. Um, software defined radios start around $20. Amazon has a lot of radios. Electronic stores usually have at least a few. They're very easy to find. Um, HTs vary greatly in price because they sometimes have additional features. There may be one that's tri-band or has multiple power modes um, or just a wider frequency range. Um, so just keep that in mind. Some of them talk English, some of them are English. <laughs> um, but you don't need a radio that does everything with all the bells and whistles. Um, the, the radio that you take out into the Daystar should be one that you're not afraid to lose or drop or spill beer on. I've done all of these things and that was just at one con. <laughs> um, and HT lets you, lets you talk to people at cons. Um, do emergency communications and generally explore. And even if you're an extra, chances are you're probably going to be spending most of your time on in frequencies that an HT would get you, which is VHF and UHF frequencies. Most of them are dual band. This is where your local hams are. This is where most of the repeaters are because those are the frequencies that they reach. Um, also, I'll go into this more in a minute, but I highly recommend getting a USB programming cable, regardless of what kind of radio you get. This will make your life so much easier than pressing a bunch of buttons, scrolling through menus. Um, Software-defined radio. You guys just heard a whole talk on that if you were st stuck around from the last one. Um, Software-defined radio is basically where your computer stands in for separate hardware components like mixers, amplifiers, um, analog digital converters. Um, so for a talk that goes um, into more depth about the science behind it, I um, highly recommend um, a talk by Nick Kartziokas from the uh, Besides Las Vegas Proving Ground last year called What the Heck is This Radio Stuff Anyway? Good talk about antenna propagation, all of the guts of an, R of an SDR. Um, they start only around $20 for the RTL SDR dongles, including the antenna. Um, they're made out of a TV tuner chip and they'll let you do a fair amount of listening and reverse engineering. The frequency range, um, it varies depending on the dongle, but most of them don't reach in the, into the 2.4 gigahertz band, 13 centimeters. Um, their website, rtlsdr.com, has really good documentation, including tutorials for projects like turning it into a spectrum analyzer and decoding various amateur signals. Uh, but sometimes you want something that can transmit, too. So there are higher-end um, SDRs, like the Blade RF and the Hack RF. Um, the Hack RF, for example, can transmit and receive anywhere between 1 megahertz and 6 gigahertz, which is pretty much all the frequencies you'd ever need. Um, you do need an amplifier for, um, for transmitting because it runs on USB power, but this is a privilege that hams have, and only hams, because of the power regulations. Um, uh, there's also a similar um, uh, radio device for um, Bluetooth work called the Ubertooth one, and a lot of good work has come out of that, and nothing like it existed before. So. Lots of possibilities there. Um, if you're good with surface mounts and have an infinite amount of patience, you could also build your own radio. Um, a good place to start is the Soft Rock kit, which is an um, SDR kit that has HF bands, it's about $80. Um, Comic is only a slight exaggeration, there's a lot of parts, but it's a really good way to learn how a radio is constructed. I mean, a lot of people say, I like to take things apart to learn how they work. Building something from raw materials can also be a great way to learn how it works. So you've got the hardware, now the software. There's a lot of software out there, so these are just a few examples. 
FL Digi is software for digital mode radio. Um, it's open source, but it's on SourceForge, so it might come with something extra. Um, it interprets digital signals into ASCII text and transmits text into digital modes, so you can start playing around with all kinds of the, the digital mode radio, and there's a bunch of them. Um, Echolink is a voice over IP system for amateur radio stations, um, so it connects repeaters all over the country. Um, Chirp uh, is what I reference with the programming cable. This will make your life so much easier. It's a really easy way to program using a USB to audio cable. There are different kinds depending on the radio that you have because the audio jacks are different. Um, in general, good for uploading and downloading information from several different kinds of radios. It makes an hour-long process take five minutes. Um, it's also one of the tools that um, comes with Kali. So if you're, if you're a pen tester, you probably already have Chirp. So step two, go crazy. See how many times you can answer the, answer the standard hacker question, what can I make this thing do? Um, a lot of hams, particularly older ones who have been uh, on the air since before the days of cell phones and the internet, are really into DXing, long distance communications, uh, usually international. So even though we have cell technology in the internet, it's still kind of cool to be able to use this old stuff and make contacts with other countries by sending electromagnetic waves into space. Um, who here does CTFs? Woo! Woo! <laughs> um, so there's a lot of different radio games you can do. Contesting, connect, contacting as many stations as possible within a given time. Um, QRP, which is trying to maximize your transmission range using really reduced power, sometimes one watt or less. Um, fox hunting, which is using radio direction finding to find hidden transmitters. Uh, they do that a lot at at cons, if you're besides Las Vegas in 2014, um, their wireless essentials class, they were walking all over the con um, with antennas. That's what they were doing. Um, speaking of which, many cons, including this one, obviously have a wireless village and a wireless CTF. So go continue to check them out. They do cool things. Space, you get to play with space. <laughs> you can use meteor scatter and the aurora borealis to propagate your signals and EME. Earth, moon, earth. You can bounce signals off the fucking moon. <laughs> um, there's also amateur satellites that you can use. Um, you can even talk to the International Space Station. Most of the astronauts and cosmonauts up there are hams. Um, just don't make it go sideways. Stick with planes. Um, and drones. Drones, you can get better range and control. I have a coworker who um, got a license specifically for the purpose of being able to fly better drones. Step three, nonprofit. I briefly mentioned uh, emergency communications before. You can join ARIES. ARIES is Amateur Radio Emergency Service. Their, model it, their motto is, when all else fails. So when natural disasters hit, the first thing that happens is all of the cell towers are wiped out. Or in the case of other public safety incidents, they're overwhelmed. Um, cell towers are often built on exposed places so that they can have a wide range. And um, cell towers also usually have police, fire, EMS on them. And in these disasters, ARIES teams step in to provide emergency communications to cities, counties, states, the Red Cross. A lot of this developed after Hurricane Katrina when they realized they needed some form of coordinated communications. Um, ARIES has been around a lot longer than that, though, obviously. Um, so we do radio communications at public service events like marathons, bike races, parades, scheduled disasters in order to prep for the real thing. In the case of the Boston Marathon bombing, a um, practice event turned into a real emergency deployment, so you never know what could happen. Even that's an extreme case. I was doing a bike event a couple of years ago where um, we were out in, a, in the middle of nowhere in farm country with no cell signal and we had a cyclist who needed medical attention. So you can do some good. And even if you never end up helping out in an actual emergency, it's just a great way to learn about operating and to connect with your local ham community. Um, I don't have a car, so it's my one chance to play with mobile equipment. Um, also, pay it forward, make more hams. Um, if you have a general license or above, you can get certified to be a volunteer examiner. And if you have an extra license, you can, um, you can give tests to all three levels. General can only do tech, so bring it up a level. Um, this is awesome, and then, so get licensed, level up, help out DC408 next year when they do exams. And with any level of license, you can also become a volunteer license instructor or an online course mentor. So above all, just have fun. Um, 
ham radio has a really well-established culture of teaching and mentorship, and many old hams have a really big stockpile of old radio gear that they'll let you play with. Um, the last Saturday in June is Field Day, which is a um, continent-wide ham radio event. Um, people camp out in parks overnight and bring their big-ass antennas and their big radios and offer a lot of opportunity for, for experimentation and community building. And ham radio is great because it offers a really low barrier entry into the world of hacking. There's a lot of reasons for this. It's the cost is low, making it accessible to more people. Kids have always been hams. Women have always been hams. There's just less gatekeeping in general. It's a hobby, not a profession. So all that there is is a passion for playing with technology and sharing knowledge. Um, another talk I highly recommend seeing is Michael Osman spoke at the Dayton Ham Fest um, last year and talked about the fact that um, before radio, the hams were all about, the last generation of hams was about um, sort of the communication aspect of it before the internet was a thing. That was what was innovative. Now, the next level of innovation in ham radio is going to be the hackers, the tinkerers. We are going to take it to the next level. Um, there's always way more to explore and not enough people are playing with radio for InfoSec or otherwise. So we're keeping, we're, we're keeping this alive and we are, the, we are the next generation of it. It's over 100 years old, but let's take it another 100 years. So, party like it's 1909. <laughs> um, so, I, I purposely left a lot of time for questions because I got a lot of questions last time I gave this talk, um, so feel free. And after I have to run off, um, please ping me on the Twitters. Um, also, shameless plug, I'm about to be looking for work again. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thanks, thanks for coming. Plaid shirt. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Um, does this mic come off? No, sorry. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, if you have an extra, I think the UK is one of the countries that has a reciprocity agreement with the US. Or you have to, okay. Um, the only one, if you have a technician license here, um, you can use it in Canada. But um, mostly with the US license, you need an extra for all other countries. Oh yeah, I can do that. And actually now that this is done. Um, actually, that's that's really hard to read. Yeah, I'll put them on my website. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, you spoke before about uh, no encryption in the radio, right, for ham radio. Yeah. So what about uh, radios that have um, encryption keys like the, the one that the Beans use here? How, how does that work? I think they're on commercial, right? Is that a commercial ban or just a ban? Can you confirm? I believe they're commercial. Okay. It might be worth maybe mentioning the distinction between a licensed individual versus a licensed device. Yeah, okay. That, that may be worth some of the confusion that's coming in. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So um, one of the key benefits of being an amateur radio licensee is you personally are licensed. And that's the key distinction. So uh, this device is unlicensed um, for the average person. Um, whereas the family radio devices that you see at Costco, the device itself is licensed, and, and that's why it'll say <coughs> it'll have an FCC license on it. That's the big distinction between us and everyone else. We personally are licensed, so I can build whatever I want. As long as I stay in my band plan, as long as I play nicely with my wattage, I can build what I want. I can sell it to Cat. Cat could sell it to you if you're licensed, but a person without a license, they could own it, but they couldn't do anything with it. So um, 
understanding that distinction, device versus person, is key. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. You summed up way better than I could. Yeah. Soft rock. <laughs> uh, last we looked about eighty dollars, I think, um, something like that. Yeah. Um, it's pretty simple. They have a what they call a take-out take-home exam, but even that is a generous term for it. Um, Basically, they've got a little form to fill out, um, which makes sure that you've read the rules of becoming a volunteer examiner, which are on their website. Um, it's just really basic stuff about the process. Um, and if you've taken the exam three times at that point, you've probably seen most of what they, how they operate. Um, so you just fill it out, send it into them. Um, the turnaround time can be up to three months, so make sure you're giving yourself enough lead time, but it's dead simple. Okay, I'll go front to back. Blue shirt. Okay. So, um, as a certified technician, uh, I was looking around at the bands. Has DEF CON done anything where you start putting up a station or is there a channel that people hang out on? Or just like I know some people use, um, just as for con chatter uh, in the past, some people have used the con, um, just a simplex frequency, uh, 14658. Uh, I don't know if that's going on this year, and I haven't heard tell of any uh, con repeaters. So, good. It is. Okay, it still is. Great. All right, black shirt. Uh, how much time do you have to take the test and read the test? Are they all? It's unlimited. Unlimited time? Yep. Theoretically, you could take all day, but in practice, you're not going to spend more than like half an hour on it. Yeah. So um, the exam is supposed to start in about 15 hours. Uh, who do I need to talk to to sign up? And then what resources should I look at right now? So it's drop-in, and since they're running till 6 tomorrow, um, you've even got more time than that. Um, so for free resources between now and then, um, like I said, one online resource that I like using is hamstudy.org because the flashcards on them on the practice test have explanations. So it'll give you some context for what you're studying. And you can also track your progress, so you can go back and see which sections you need to study up more. So they've got the whole question pool from all three levels. All right. So they use an FRC number? They use the FRC number right? Oh, um, you technically don't need to have an FRN number um, before you get licensed, but or before you take the test, but I highly recommend doing that because the alternative is putting your social security number on the exam. So it's entirely possible for any one of us, not knowing anything about him, to go to the FRC yeah. Okay. yeah. And really, you, you, you don't have anything to lose. Other than fifteen dollars, I guess. But <laughs> yeah. What kind of a license was that? What's that? You use the acronym FRN. Oh, sorry. FRN is uh, what is it? Federal registration number, or something like that. Um, it's the number that you get that's a, that's going to be associated with your um, with your radio license, and um, you go online to get it, and that way it, it's you would be issued it if you didn't have one going into your exam. Um, based on, um, but then you would need to put your social security number on the exam application. And so for privacy reasons, a lot of people like to register their FRN first. Yeah. If someone had gotten a license, say, 20 years ago, would they automatically have an FRN even if it had expired? I believe so. I think the FRN transcends beyond the bounds of the license. Yep. Okay. Sure. I'm sorry? Online, if you just Google FRN. Uh, let me, actually, I don't have my Wi Fi on. Uh, it, it would just be the FCC website, right? Yeah, it's just the FCC site. Okay, you want to hear up next? Instantaneously. Yeah, like literally, when I helped out on ham exams at DEF CON 22, we were telling people while they were standing in line for the test to um, get out their phones and get their FRNs. So, yeah. Do you have another question? No? Okay, sorry, I thought I saw a hand up. Yeah, the FCC, the, I think it's just ULS.FCC.gov um, or something like that. But if you, 
Yeah, something like that. I don't recall the exact URL. So, yeah. All right. That's great. Well, thanks for coming.